Hello and welcome to the podcast. I am your host, Jesse Cannon, and today I'm talking to Barty Strange. So there's a reason I wanted to do this episode. I have been friends with Bartiz for a while, as you'll hear in this, and I thought his journey from somebody who literally just over a year ago had zero monthly listeners to now being one of the most critically acclaimed artists, has Pitchfork Best New Music, hundreds of thousands of monthly listeners, press everywhere, literally made Rolling Stone spin all these best album lists and just has one of the most explosive records of the year under his belt now. I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the journey because his journey is actually, you know, people would think, oh, wow, that just happened overnight. He just made a good record. No, you'll hear in this episode, he did so much smart strategy to get him where he is today and really just worked so hard doing the right decisions and doing little incremental steps that got him there. And we detail every little bit of that so that you can get an idea of what goes into it. And you know, I'm always talking to you guys about community and how community is what builds an artist up. This is one of the best tales of that. And, you know, I've been lucky to be in a community with Bartiz for a long time. And truly, he built up this career from who he knows in the community. And we're going to get all into that. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. If you haven't heard Live Forever, his record, I highly suggest you fix that immediately. And other than that, if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe and make sure you get notified because we're going to be doing more fun stuff like this on the channel. Hope you enjoy this. Here we go. So thank you so much for doing this, buddy. Uh, As we were just saying before we aired, you were literally one of the last people I saw before we were confined to our house. It's uh, we both recklessly went out and did one last show. Yeah, we did. We did. It was good to be (laughs) here. And thanks for having me. And maybe that show shouldn't have happened, but it's okay. We are. We are here today. (laughs) Everybody has a last show. You were mine. That's the thing. And, uh, you know, everybody's alive and that's what what matters. Definitely. Um, Definitely. So, what I wanted to have you here today to talk about is I keep talking about you, and I guess it's always weird to pay somebody a big compliment, is I talk about how you believed in yourself and you kept pushing for this record that has now gone on to a damn good amount of acclaim and success. And even though when you started out, like, you know, I can remember looking at the page when it wasn't three digits of monthly listeners on Spotify, and now it's a lot more digits than that. And I wanted to talk about your journey so that people could understand kind of what went on to build this up to get where you are. So I guess the first place to talk about is uh, where you and I met, because I think that's even an interesting thing, is that you were in another band. You finished a record. And shortly after that record's out, you're like, you know, I believe in what I'm doing in a different way and I'm going to pursue it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was a very scary, that was really a scary thing for me to do. Yeah, I played in a band called Stay Inside, which is a great band. And um, I've also gone on to very do great big acclaim. Yeah. yeah, to do great things. Um, but yeah, um, me and Chris, the lead, were one of the guitarists and singers in that band, met on Craigslist. And I worked with Brennan Vishnu at MakerBot and we were all loved the same type of music and thought it'd be a good idea to start a band and it was a great band and we did some really cool things and they've gone on to do great things. But yeah, I played in that band. We recorded that record at your studio. After we cut that record, we played a little while. and But at the same time, I was always making all of these other things. And I was also playing in like three other bands. Like I was playing yes. in a country band. Like I was playing for Melanie Charles. I was playing for this dude, Stefan Marcellus, who like got, he, we played at the Apollo a couple times. So like I was starting to kind of see like, okay, there's like so many layers to, to playing music, like being a guitar player, being an engineer, being a producer, being the lead singer, booking the show. Like I was learning all of this infrastructure that I didn't really understand existed. Or you were I, really curious too. Like that was yeah. one of the things that really impressed me was that, there's a lot of people who do that, but they're just like doing it to fill the time. You were trying to find the answer, I felt like. Yeah. Well, I was like, how does this actually work? You know, because I remember watching, you know, honestly, I saw so many great bands put out great music and nobody heard it. Yeah. You know, like it, you know, I was just like over and over and over again. Bands that I thought were just like 10 times more impressive than me, who had way more money than me, even who mm-hmm. I thought were way more connected. And then there were bands who I thought had really made it. And now I'm realizing they really didn't make it. Like they were just like, 
the cool kid at the moment. But in the moment, everything felt so big. And I felt so overwhelmed by music and the music industry. And I was just like, I got to figure this out. And so that kind of led me to play in all these bands and ask all these questions and, and, you know, played a big foundational part in where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you go out on your own and it's not even yet a different moniker. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So you're making the, this jump. What, I think one of the things people have trouble with is like a lot of the time though, is, is like, you know, the fear that's going into that jump. What got you past the initial thing of like, you know, even like I know so many people play, stay in a band just because they don't want to upset people. Like what was yeah. driving you under there? Yeah. So I'm like the most non-confrontational person you'll ever meet. <laughs> Brian knows this. Like yeah, everyone, yeah. like if people who know me know, I don't like arguing. I don't like confrontation at all. And the last thing I want to do is quit a band that I've pretty much started <laughs> after we <laughs> finished our first like lo- like full length record. I was like mortified and I love them also. Mm-hmm. They're my friends. Yeah, great people. Like I love them, each of them a lot and believe in them, you know, and they mm-hmm. believed in me. And that was like why that band had, it's still together, you know, stay mm-hmm. inside because they really believe in each other. I felt like I was letting them down and I was mm-hmm. really afraid. I was also afraid that I would quit the band and they would pop off. Which, <laughs> which, kinda which actually did happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is that funny thing. Is it's like it's just the, the unlikely scenario that you both popped off. Right, right. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, this is probably the worst decision I've ever made. But I really, but I had all this music, and it was interesting. Like, and I mean, I actually liked it. And I was like, you know, there's this like this bigger statement I want to make with my music that I feel like I can only make with like like myself, like I have the mm-hmm. clarity to do it now. And I didn't have that clarity four years prior. Like people have definitely asked me like, oh, like literally people have said, oh, it's a bummer that like you've put this record out and you're like in your thirties and like, you're not, and I'm like, when the hell, when else was I going to be able to do this? Like I yeah. had, to, had to learn everything, like get here and then to process it and to know how to say it and to know who to give it to and to know like you know it's like you can't you can't do that when you're 24 it, you know it's a hundred percent true and like mm-hmm. i think people often you know like when i consult with musicians so many times they're like oh i'm too old to do this i'm like do you look at the average age of a lot of people who do well in this it's not 22 it's mm-hmm. often late 20s early 30s and because like especially if you're doing you know your record is complex blend of influences i don't think anybody on earth could take that away from you and you don't get that at 18 i would i am sometimes shocked by how complex some 18 year olds music are but it is the rarest thing on earth to be able to do that at 18 yeah i I wouldn't have been able to make it at all (laughs) (laughs) but um i another part of like that journey was i found myself wanting to learn more about like engineering and production and like Mm -hmm. mixing. And because I felt like most records I had worked on or bands that I'd been in, I never was completely satisfied with how the record sounded. And Mm -hmm. And I also had like a weird thing with my voice where I was like, I was kind of struggling with like being a lead singer like I had never been one before. And I, it was almost like becoming a lead singer was admitting to myself that I was taking music more seriously. It was like a whole like journey to being comfortable with being like, this is my band and this is what I'm trying to do. It was way easier to just be like a guitar player, you know, and just be like, yeah, I just pull up. But um, yeah, like all of those things were happening at the same time as I got closer and closer to writing Live Forever and putting it all together. I, I mean, I can remember, it'd be so funny is like, for the audience, I'm a producer who will get, you know, I'll do a hundred takes on one line if we have to. And I can remember you did one take that was like a verse that was just like flooring. And I'm like, dude, that's it. And you're like, that can't be it. We didn't do a, do all these takes. And I'm like, no, you just <laughs> killed it. And it was like the funny thing of like you watching you get the confidence to listen back like, oh, I did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, was a, that was a huge experience for me yeah. because I'd never been in a studio with someone who could like, who was with an actual producer who had worked with vocalists mm-hmm. and, and I got good feedback, you know, someone mm-hmm. being like, Hey, you're good at this. You should yeah. think about this, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like every, and like you get those every so often in life. And yeah. I think it's important to like listen to those moments and really mm-hmm. internalize it because most people are not going to tell you you're good, even if you are. Yeah. That's totally true. Sometimes, especially if you are, 
<laughs> like, I know, th- that's you know. A, that's the even better point is like the weird penis sword fight shit that men go through especially in this mm-hmm. business is like the worst thing and it really is like one of the better lessons is like learning how to tell people I, I, I get better at it still and I feel like as a producer you're a professional compliment giver because if you're not you got insecure people exactly and I still feel like there's like, like I go through it with our, for the audience sake you've worked with Brian who works with me a bunch since then and it's like that thing of like I sub Sometimes forget to say the compliment when it's really good. Like he sent me some music yesterday that I commissioned and I'm like, fix this, this, this. And I'm like, that was actually really great. You're supposed to say the compliment first. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, don't just say what needs to be changed first. That's mm-hmm. not how criticism works. <laughs> right. <laughs> or how people's brains work, right? Yeah. 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 You want to really. hear the good stuff first. Yeah. People want to know they did something good. But um, <laughs> And then I like, after that session, I kind of went on like a tear of like, mm-hmm. I'm going to learn how to engineer my own stuff. Like I, and I, and that journey was honestly what gave me like the, the real confidence because I hit a point where I was like, I know how to make myself sound good. Woo. Like big. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Big well, but, <laughs> And that's, uh, I think, something people always also forget is, like, when they're, like, scared, it's like, dude, every time you get better at controlling things, that's mm-hmm. what gives you confidence to believe mm-hmm. in yourself. A hundred percent. And, you know, once that happened, I, I was like, you know, I had written, like, an acoustic album. Mm-hmm. And I was playing and stay inside. I had the solo acoustic album. I was playing some country music for a band, playing a few other bands, and I just started quitting bands. I had a buddy named Sam Stuckey who was like, yo, you should quit your bands and just focus on your own thing more and more people were starting to say, you need to focus on your own thing. And inside, like, I was like, I've always wanted to try this. Like, and I think I have something to offer. And uh, I also had like some bigger, like artistic ideas that I knew I couldn't actualize in any of my projects. And so I was just like, well, I'm just gonna have to take a risk and quit all these bands and try this and see if people like it. And so I was just doing my side project and playing and stay inside. The side project was literally so I could just get reactions to my music. And like, see if people liked it, see if it was any good, build, build some confidence. And I started realizing like, just as many people were coming to my solo shows as they were coming to like my full band shows. And I was mm. like, okay, I'm going to invest in this a little more. So everything I did was incremental. Like I never yeah. made like a big jump. And I think a lot of people feel like, oh, if I'm going to do music, I got to quit my job or I got to leave my girlfriend or I yeah, got to like, the a big part yeah. of your story too is you're still working during mm-hmm. a lot of this. You moved to DC. Yeah. yeah. I was working a very full-time job as a political consultant and a comms director at a climate organization and like, which, which is doing insane. It. Like doing it <laughs> yeah. like 50 hours a week, really, really doing it. Um, and had been for the, like, you know, the last 10 years, like since I was 21 years old. And so, you know, I just had an engine, like I really wanted to do it. And that was also why everything was incremental, you know, because <laughs> I was like, but I, but it was safe. And I think that was like how I needed to do it, you know, like step by step by step until now. Mm-hmm. So next part of the journey you put out, it's one song, just in a cab at first. Yeah. In a cab. Mm-hmm. So what so what happens from there? Yeah. So as I kind of was getting demos together, I mean, me being, I mean, I think I'm a kind of like socially savvy person. And I understand that relationships are important to being successful in any aspect of life. Mm -hmm. And so I started kind of looking around to see who was doing things bigger than me. And uh, a lot of bands I realized were working with a woman named Jamie Coletta. And I just literally started following her on everything. I sent her a bunch of music from Stay Inside over the previous two years, but she never really was into it. She was always busy. And she also had a job at the time. But around the time that I was getting my demos together, she had left that job and started her own firm. And I wrote her like the magnum opus email <laughs> of like, please believe in me. I think I have something here. And like sent her in a cab and she was like, okay, I can't commit to the record, but I can work with you on this single. And that was like kind of where it all started. And like we did the single and I think she was even surprised by like the feedback she had received. And she was like, yeah, we should let's work on the whole record together. And I went and made the record. And then like, we started like, she introduced me to an idea that I hadn't heard. And it was an idea that I also read about in your book was like, building a team around your music and not thinking like, Oh, cool. I have a few songs. I need a record label. Like thinking more like, okay, I have a few songs. 
how can I best position these few songs to do well, even if I don't have a record label or a booking agent or any of these things? Like, what are, like, the crucial pieces to getting me to, like, the next little baby step? And uh, Jamie, like, played a huge role in helping me, like, actualize that. Like, getting these people incrementally over literally two years um, until we release the record. And that's another part people don't know. Yeah, like, that's, that, that's what I really yeah. want to focus on. Is yeah. So, like, you put out this first song some people start to notice you the numbers start going up i mean i i can remember hit, wanting to listen to the song again and hitting play on spotify and be like oh all right you know there's a lot more people tuning in but you so you go to make this record do i remember you got like a a grant for the house or something oh yeah so my buddy carter his brother runs a nonprofit called think olio and they were they were just like yeah like you can cut the record like up here in the barn it's an artist of, it's a, your residency kind of thing um, but you know they they helped us out they gave us a place to record and basically like Brian and I Brian D'Amelio we were like okay like I had gone on this whole thing about like oh I gotta find like a producer and I gotta find like this fancy engineer and I did all this research and then I was like. Mm, I'm gonna do it myself with my friends <laughs> like <laughs> because I started getting a better under the more i recorded stuff the more i realized like the real thing you need to make a great record is time period like one great microphone and a bunch of time i could make literally anything and so like it's and, part of the rick rubin philosophy yeah and i was like well i'm gonna give myself the most time possible which means i'm not gonna pay anyone and it's i can't pay anyone a ton of money because if i was paying a ton of money i'd have like four days in a studio to mm -hmm. cut all this music and this way i had like 10 days plus unlimited time <laughs> you know because it's my friends and i'm giving them points anyways and whatever like that's just how that's gonna rock pay pay them what i can and give them points and so yeah we all we hauled all of our gear up to say new york put it in this like little like converted barn like studio apartment that the airbnb at sometimes and it was like me and like every person i made music with over the last like preceding six years and when I think back, I'm like, no wonder the record was so good because it's like so much love in the room. It was like all the people who had taught me how to engineer, like Brian and Nick Rapley, all the people I played with in every band previous, like all, it was just like the who's who of my musical life was like coming through in and out of this room as I was making the record. And yeah, and, and Brian and I just like captured it. Like Brian was running the session. I made most of the producing choices. And then, you know, I don't know. It was a, it was a great... 10 11 days so you finish up the record and this is like two years like we mastered it two years ago or like summer mm -hmm. so what happens in all of that time and why did you wait a year and a half to put this record out that's i think that's the big chunk of it is that like yeah that for an artist that's torture that's literally like having a the sword of damocles coming closer and closer you're just like I have this amazing record and a lot of, we should also say one of the other torturous things I think about it is that everyone around you has heard this record is like, this record is fucking incredible. Like I can remember I'm mastering it and I'm like, what in the fuck did y'all do? And I had even known a little because Brian had sent me some mixes to be like, mm -hmm. can you put an ear on this? It's one thing when you believe in a record. It's another thing to want to just leak it when everybody's telling you it's fucking incredible so talk to yeah. me about sitting on it and what happened at that time so yes oh my gosh it was literally two years ago in like this month that i had that i left um with Saic and was done like recording that chunk of the record but no that two years was is like the crucial part of all of this like when we finished the record brian and i took a bunch of time to mix we probably shot upwards of 15 to 20 versions of songs back and forth because I, I can remember him being like is this okay that we're doing this i'm like complex music got to do that sometimes yeah and well and i had to brian's like credit and his patience like i had a vision you know like i really knew yeah. what i wanted it to sound like and i had never had that before and mm -hmm. i had never known how to do it yeah. <laughs> so I was going to like, I was going to like make sure that it at least sounded like how I wanted it in my mind, in my brain. And that was why I wanted to do it with me and Brian. Like, cause mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have like hands on this and I'm going to get to really approve mixes and really be like, I like that. I don't like that. I want to bring this in. You know, like it was good. It was a great thing for me to do at that point in my little engineer mix life. Yeah. After that, we got the record mixed. 
you did a master on it. We had something. And I remember taking it to Jamie and Jamie liked it. I think I was afraid of the record because I don't feel like I, I was always like, does anyone really like this? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> like, this, <laughs> this thing sounds crazy. And I was like, I was like, this is overwhelming. But Jamie was like, we gotta, we gotta start sharing this record with literally everyone in the music industry that we've ever talked to. She was like, we cannot put this record out until we have like critical mass. Like everyone has got to be bought in the second it comes out because no one's going to know how to process this. And so I was like, okay, that sounds like a really hard thing to do. And I've never <laughs> any of it. It's like pointing at a mountain. Okay, we got to go climb that. Like, yeah. And I was like, I've never climbed a mountain before. Like, what do you do? And she was like, well, it'd be great if you had a booking agent. It'd be great if you had a manager. It'd be great if you had a publisher. It'd be great. And, and she starts naming all these people and I start to kind of see the game slow down. You know, like mm-hmm. I was like, oh, so like if I get a great publisher, I don't necessarily need like this other thing that I think I need. Like, mm-hmm. and kind of seeing that success can happen in so many ways. But Jamie like really stepped up and that's why she's one of my managers now. Like she introduced me to my first like, booking agent at the Feldman agency. I'm Stephen Himmelfarb, who was like, a, a, he also books for like Orville Peck and a number of other Wolf Parade and a number of pop great bands. And I was like shocked that he wanted to work with me. I had like one song out and nothing else. And he was excited to work with me. And I remember being like, whoa, this is different. Like people are reacting to this in a way that no one's ever reacted to my stuff. And, and we were also shopping it to labels tons and tons of labels. Um, and we were just kind of building a case for myself. We we're like, okay, cool. We've got this booking agent. Cool. Like that's going to help us. We talked to labels. As, as we were talking to labels, we met um, AJ Toby at Rough Trade, who's another friend of Jamie's and like for the publishing side. And I had, then I had like a publisher and a booking agent and I was like, whoa, I don't have anything out, but things are lining up, you know? And this wasn't like a two month thing. Like this is like now nine months after the record probably that I have now shared my record with like dozens of labels, dozens of booking agents, dozens of publishers until I found the right people who were actually excited about what I was doing and believed in me. And we just like kept looking for the next person. The next person was... And there was a lot of no's in there as well. Infinity. (laughs) I still feel like I am getting them. Like, it's like, I can't even express to you how sure I was that the record was horrible because of like, how much runaround people gave me on like, if they wanted to sign me, Oh my, like seriously nightmarish situations of labels being like, Oh yeah, we like you, but we, we're going to go with this other person. And it's literally like a black guy with an acoustic guitar. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I tell people like getting the callous to know is three fourths of the game. Like I, and I always tell the story, like I can remember sitting backstage and it was a really weird thing. I watched the killers get turned down for a U2 tour. And they're huge at this point. Like, one of the biggest bands in the world. And they're still bummed. And they still move on. (laughs) And everything was fine. And they kept going. Because even the Killers posts, Sam's Town gets turned down for a tour. Yo, I mean, that's it. But shit like that is good to hear. And, like, I remember going through that and thinking, like, it gave me, like, a resilient... It gave me a fuck you to making music because I've realized I was like okay if nobody's gonna like it but me cool fuck (laughs) y'all like I I know it's good like I think you know and I I immediately was just like I think I have better taste than these people (laughs) (laughs) that's what you're supposed yeah you're supposed to feel that way yeah I had to like create that feeling because uh, in the beginning I was just like damn like boomer it's throwing people Mm -hmm. off like I gotta take it off the record like it's too much wow like that's crazy Oh, we should yeah. note for the audience that doesn't know you. This is your number one song on Spotify? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> like the song that people ask me for. A song that I almost didn't record because I thought it was too much. Like, I, I remember hearing, like, writing the demo and being like, this is like a Weird Al version of a rock song. Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like a medley of, like, 90s and early 2000s rock and hip-hop. And I thought it was weird. But Brian D'Amelio was like, oh no, we are definitely not leaving until we record that. Like, <laughs> like that was all Brian. But yeah, anyways, I was like second guessing everything like you would anyways after making mm-hmm. a record, but I had two years to do it. But anyways, at like the nine month mark, I went on a meeting with Alec Bemis, 
who works at Grassland Records. And I was pitching him on Live Forever. And and I was like, yeah, like, you know. And we should record. say Brassland is the Nationals label. Yes, it's owned by Aaron Desner. And the National put out their first three records on it or something like mm-hmm. that. Three or four records. And those records are still on that catalog. Um, Crazy. Which Alec manages. So I was like looking for a label for Live Forever. And Alec was like, ah, I'm sorry, can't help you because we're working on this band called the Nationals record right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that sounds like a light lift. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. And I was like, out of literally nowhere, Jesse, I was like, oh, well, I'm thinking about covering a bunch of their songs. Like I made it up. Like I had the idea for it, but I didn't think I was going to actually do it. And he was like, oh, send it to me. And I immediately left that meeting and called like Brian Graham Carter. And it was just like, we got to write like five songs, like, like now. <laughs> and, and they all came over and we just started working on them. And when we finished that little EP, we decided to put it out before Live Forever. We were going to put Live Forever out. Which was, which was a, I mean, I remember talking about this decision. I yeah. was like, this could go a lot of different ways. Yo, really could have. But I, at that point, had like maximum clarity. Like I was like, Live Forever is super ambitious. And I think that people need an on-ramp. Like mm-hmm. people need an on-ramp for like the message that I'm trying to like get out, which is this bigger statement on like black people and rock music Mm -hmm. and like where we fit in and how we deserve more space in that world. And um, I was like, what better way to show that than to cover what is probably my favorite band, but is also like a quintessential staple of the genre that I want to be a part of and like kind of take what they've done and be like, this is cool. But why aren't there more people doing it that look like me? Like, why aren't there more bands that have had this level of success that look like me? And and that was something that I didn't want to necessarily talk about the whole time Live Forever was out. But using Say Goodbye to Pretty Boy to talk about it felt really appropriate and like a great way to introduce myself to like the broader world. And the National have a huge fan base already. So national fans love national fans. And I thought yeah. this would be like a really great way to like build a fan base with people that already like similar sonic things and then, you know, bring them into my world when the time is right. So, yeah. And I remember there was a discussion of like, should you wait to put this out after live forever or before? And I was like, I remember I like, I could straight up say like, I was on the scared side when you and I talked about it. And I was like, Oh, I wonder if this like makes you too much of a fan than a real artist. Like I was, mm-hmm. I was definitely like, Oh, I hope, yeah. I hope this is the right step. Cause like, honestly, you know, there's a lot of decisions where you're like, if I get enough data, I could know it. There's no fucking data to know whether that was going to work. Yeah. Yeah. But it felt like, uh, yeah, it felt right. Mm-hmm. And you were right. Yeah. I was All right, so right. that record comes out and mm-hmm. you get a lot of acclaim for it. People love it. Yeah. I could remember literally being on the street running into a friend not far from where i live now and somebody's like yo have you heard this record and i'm just dying laughing like hell yeah <laughs> that's 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 what you you want to hear <laughs> yo that's dope <laughs> oh man but yeah no after that came out i remember thinking oh shit everyone's gonna expect me to make stuff like this they're not gonna like what i have you know like mm-hmm. that was my the next thing i was afraid of but it opened some doors um we finally found a label um, Will Yip. Talk about this story about how Will Yip hears it, because this is really interesting. Yeah, well, I think, how did he initially hear it? I th- isn't it that you played a show with that band? Car, Dog Car. Play? That's the band. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, Car, and then, Car. Did, Don't they bring oh it to Oh, my him? gosh. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, because, I, you know, like, I often tell bands about that your community is the most important <laughs> thing, and this is, like, the epitome of one of those stories that it tells you exactly why your community is so important. Yeah, actually, okay, okay. So this is a funny story because now we're all friends. Like, mm-hmm. me and the Car Car guys are, like, homies. <laughs> like, the uh, we were playing a show here in D.C. at the Pie Shop, and uh, the drummer was, like, Oh, yo, like you're Barchie Strange. I'm like, yeah. And he was like, oh, I love the national. We're all like big national fans. We love your record. And I was like, yeah, like, and I sent him, I think I sent them Live Forever before the show. And they were like, yeah, like, 
you know, Live Forever is dope. We loved it. We listened to it the whole time. I think it's going to be a little too lo-fi for Will, though, if you're looking for a label. <laughs> oh, I, I, I remember because Brian texts me, and he's like, I can't believe they called it lo-fi. I'm like, listen, people don't know how to describe music. It's not a lo-fi record. It has a lot of color. There's a very big difference. Like, Guided by Voices, early records where you hear, like, the hum because they recorded it on a fucking car battery. Like, that's that's one thing. This is a... a colorful record people just don't know how to call it that yeah i was like it's character rich yeah yes yes there we go there we go character rich recording but um yeah oh my god and i took that so many ways (laughs) (laughs) and i tell people you know it's it's like it's also like one of the hardest things like i can remember you and i had this discussion is people freak out when they hear distortion on their voice at first yes and i can remember being like you love distortion on everybody else's voice take that with the thing and if you don't like it i'll turn it down but everybody hates distortion on their own voice and loves it on everyone else voice so real and now i saturate my voice all the time <laughs> yeah I, I have to like literally tell myself not to i have a saturation <laughs> bus that is just <laughs> literally screaming on all my doubles <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's stupid and anyways but afterwards like we stayed in touch jamie also reached out to will and like he loved the record and we really hit it off but i think it was in large part because like i played with the car car folks they've definitely shared my record with will Like Jamie shared it with Will and Will, it clicked with him. And like Will and I are homies now. And like, and so we should, we just for the audience who doesn't know, Will Yip is a producer of a bajillion bands and he has two different labels one through Run for Cover, one through Warner and uh, called Memory Music. And that's the one you ended up on. Yeah. I'm Mm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want Memory. And it's great. Like they service the, the record immaculately. And I don't think I would have got that level of attention or like care anywhere else. Like Will literally made it like his personal passion project and like paid money to make everything work. Like paid for a radio promoter, paid for a, like not only did he pay for Jamie to do PR, but he also paid for someone to do PR in Europe, like paid for the vinyl, paid for the merch, like really went in and was really fair on the master split, like really solid, like a situation that most people don't get for their first album. And it was something, something he said to me, like, at, right when he signed me, is he was like, I, I thanked him. I was like, look, like, thank you for being so flexible with this deal. And he was like, dude, I make money off of making records. Like I'm making this record with you so that in a year you pop off and you have, a, a, a bidding war for you among labels like he was like literally that's what we're doing <laughs> like we're gonna we're building this campaign over the course of the next year and now like it's a year la- later and i'm literally like doing exactly what he said so it's like it's awesome like well like i will not i cannot like i, I will never take for granted like the impact that he had <laughs> on this record big impact now we're like on our sixth pressing of like our sixth like thousand record pressing of the album. Awesome. So, but so in that interim, when you meet Will, there's still a lot more time that happens through that and you get some more of a team, right? Yes. So, um, I meet Will and at this point, like I've got a publisher, I've got a booking agent, I've got now Jamie as my manager and she brought on a friend to help co-manage because Jamie's never managed a band before. And so she was like, you know, like I want to manage, but if I do it, I want to have a close friend who's like been trying to get me into managing. And it was Tim Zahodsky, who like, you know, worked with the Menzingers and tons of humongous rock bands. Um, great guy. Great dude. And has like a really great attitude and a great like way of doing business. Watching him work has been very like educational because he's like been in it much longer than me. So then all of a sudden I had like a squad felt like I was like, okay, like we can kind of do anything now, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) I had like all these people advocating for me in all these rooms that I didn't have access to. And that's ultimately like what you want is like as an artist, three or four people who believe in your stuff so much that they're like literally telling everyone they meet about you. And like it literally, it starts from there. And it's kind of funny. Like I never thought this is a dumb thing to say, but I think something a lot of people will understand is like, I never appreciated how important it is to have music that's actually good. I always thought that people just kind of popped off because they were connected or they had like a lot of money. And that was kind of what I had seen in Brooklyn. 
there are a lot of people that pop off and you're like, this makes no sense. And then you're like, oh, they went to NYU and their mom is an actress and they do this and their dad is a lawyer who works with so-and-so, Lear Cohen, and that's how it happened. You know, it's like... Yeah, it's you know? the funny thing. And, you know, what you're saying is the thing I've... I try to tell people, but, you know, like, my parents always said this thing of, like, you know, like, I was a very bad kid. They're like, look, you have to learn your own lessons. You're going to have to put your hand on the stove and get burned. And one of the lessons I think you can't always teach musicians until they see it is how many people get money and connections thrown at them and it goes fucking nowhere. And, you know, like my two and a half years working at Atlantic Electra, the amount of people I saw them throw at the wall and put money, big budget videos. And it's just like all those connections, they're working hard. They're doing mm -hmm. things. And it's like, wow, they have less listens than my friends bands who like get a hundred people on a show. Maybe it just doesn't work. It's like the good music is if it's, it doesn't matter if you have that major label record deal. Mm -hmm. I think good gets a little bit risen up, but like great. You got to be great. If you're going to really have the doors open and you made this amazing record that, everybody who gets it really feels something with and that's what opens a lot of the doors that's what definitely opened those doors because at some point like someone has to decide has to pick you like someone has to be like oh i like this music like before it hits thousands of people through a spotify playlist there's like normally two or three people who have to like it and that's who you're playing for and um they won't choose it if it's not good because they already have a list of 50 people that they have to choose because mm -hmm. they paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there's that, but it's funny. And there was like, oh, well, what if I'm one of those people paid for it? It's like, well, if people don't add it to their own playlist or go back and listen to it, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, doesn't there's, matter. There's a million people out there who get added to those playlists and they have the 200,000 monthly listeners for five days because they're on that playlist and then it never happens again. Yeah. Or they don't have any actual fans. Mm -hmm. Like they just have like plays, which is very prominent. Like that's real. Yeah. Like I know a lot of people like that. I produce now for a lot of people like that who just mm. have tons of plays and like they don't play shows, you know? Yeah. Well, the funny thing is we are in that weird world right now where it's like, well, no mm -hmm. one plays shows again yet, but there's a lot of demand for when you come out and play shows again. Which is great. I'm excited yeah. about that. But yeah, and so anyways, sorry, I keep getting sidetracked, but Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a complex story. It's it a lot happened. Like after <laughs> it's like so the summer lead after like Say Goodbye to Pretty Boy came out, it was in March. We played at WNYC and we played a show at the Sultan Room. And then that was literally like the last day of Earth. Like mm -hmm. there was like lines around the block at the key foods. I felt like I was in a contagion, like two movie. God, and then, I forgot that that's your record release show that we're at right before yeah. Corona. Holy shit. That's yeah. Crazy. That was the say goodbye to pretty boy record release show. The next week we were driving to South by Southwest for like our first like decent tour. Oh God, I forgot. Holy shit. Yeah. Like yo, I was like riding the high and I was like, please God, let me get to do this. And it didn't <laughs> work out. Right? <laughs> Everything gets canceled. And I was kind of bummed. And I was like, oh no, like this record is, no one's going to remember Say Goodbye to Pretty Boy. I was wrong. Everyone bought the <laughs> shit out of it and it worked out great. And everyone played it and I met a lot of cool people. And then we were, it was, the summer came and I felt like every band was like, do I release my record this year or not? Mm -hmm. Like, do I wait till the next year to do it? And I remember talking to Jamie and Tim and being like, I don't know what to do. But yeah. my calculation here is most people will need a lot of things to make music. Like they need like a producer, they need a big studio, they need all this shit, but I don't need any of it. Like I can make good stuff at my house all the time. I do it every day. So like, I'm just going to keep making music and let's put this record out. And if it flops, I'll just put out another record. Like, <laughs> and that was like a, I'm really glad I felt that way. I'm glad I felt like I could just make another good record. You know, I think a lot of people are like, this is the one. Yeah, yeah. Get too precious about it for sure. Right. But I'm like, this is like not the one. <laughs> this is like a good record. And I can't wait to make a million, five more great records. But you did take some songs off. I did. I shortened yeah. it by like four songs. Yeah. Which was really smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, yet again, Rick Rubin message. I tell everybody, it write two and a half records, put out one. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm in the process of that right now. I'm like, look, yeah. I've like, yeah. But anyways, and so we just decided to go for it. And then came the problem of like, well, how do we develop content like now? Like, how do we make music videos and stuff to promote the record? Which led to many like pretty complicated Zoom slash my <laughs> iPhone video 
like videos that turn into music videos that that have all of them have done really well and were great. But yeah, like after we put out our first single, I got a call from Tom Windish and like he wanted to be my booking agent. And so that's that's what happened. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yes, let's do that. And that was like after like Boomer came out or something. Mm. And so did that. And then labels started calling like before the record even came out. And I was like, damn, like we had a meeting with Island Records and I was like, OK, this is wild. <laughs> like i hope that yeah. record you get rave reviews from every outlet tons of year-end top 10 50 records yeah the record came out and it really jumped off and i remember like right before the record came out i was still nervous i was still like is yeah. this gonna really work they like mustang but that's kind of like the most straightforward song on the record uh mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes and I remember getting the whole band together and being like, let's go to Maine for a couple of weeks and start pre-producing the next record. Just mm -hmm. because I know after this record comes out, I'm going to be a different person. And I kind of wanted to like mm -hmm. capture as much as I could as that person right before the record came out. That's very smart. Yeah. And I'm glad I did like, cause we yeah. wrote, like a great record there. And I have that record now. That's awesome. And I have another one that I've written since then. And so, I'm, so now I'm like, okay, I've got like eight months to record these two records. And that's what's happening. <laughs> that's that's where I'm awesome. At, talking well, to labels and, and figuring out when I'm going to record these, this, this next batch of music. So that's one incredibly genius. Cause obviously I wrote a whole book on how expectations of your music is, is actually what fucks it up the most. And being uh -huh. true to yourself is what makes it right. And knowing to do that is incredibly intelligent because. It's tough when people like you for something and you got to go, huh? Well, these next songs aren't that thing. You already yeah. went through that once with that AP. I, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to remember. I forget that. The people yeah. are like, oh, this is your sophomore album. I'm like, actually, no, Live Forever was my sophomore album. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, but, and, and that is the thing. And I think that maybe that is, the, you know, I wanted to do this to get some good through lines for people to learn from it. It, it is that funny thing is like, you know, you've put yourself out there and it's set you up for good success continually by yeah. being pushing yourself a little bit past it. And particularly too, like that, that thing of all those no's and putting yourself out there and just continually trying to find that team. Like that's fucking tough, man. And I'm so glad you did it. And a lot of people are, cause they love this record. Hey, I'm so thankful. So I'm so grateful. Like I, every day, I, I mean, I don't have a full-time job anymore. I, I just do music and I produce, I produce for artists. I've been working on records since like, like full-time since August, you know, two records a month, pretty stably. Like, which is nuts. I mean, I'm, I'm stoked because I'm like, yeah, like I didn't get to record my records as fast as I wanted, but like I, in the next year to two, will have like multiple releases, um, which I think is going to be really cool. A cool way to That's like awesome. add, add to what I can do, you know? So I'm, I'm excited about it. Well, I think that's the story. Do you want to tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter. Just look up Barty Strange. Facebook, it's the same. I'm not on TikTok yet, but I will be <laughs> at some point soon. So I'm also Barty Strange on TikTok. Um, but you can stream my music on Spotify and buy it on Bandcamp. Am I missing anything? Is there any other way you would have done this? I need to know your questions and what no one else is telling you since I want to answer them. So leave them in the comments since I answer every comment in every post. I hope you liked this video. And if you did, please like, subscribe, and get notified. And I'm going to be breaking down the concepts in this video along with how to promote your music and how to make songs you're happy with in the future. I have a Facebook group linked below that is only helpful information. No playlist or con artists, only artists having helpful discussions allowed. If you want to learn more about me, work on a record with me, or check out any of my books, podcasts, or anything else I do, go to jessiecannon.com or at jessiecannon on all the socials. One last thing, there's two playlists here. One is on how to grow your fan base from zero to 10,000 fans, and the other is on how you make songs you're more happy with. And the other is on how you promote your music with Spotify. And the other is specially chosen to match this video. Or you can hit the subscribe button below and stay tuned as I have tons of tips for musicians.